A reading from Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Take off your gold rings that are on your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So the people took off their gold rings from their ears, and they brought them to Aaron. And he took the gold from them and formed it in a mold and cast the image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw all this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast festival to the Lord. And they rose early the next day, offered burnt offerings, brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, who you brought up from, out from the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now, let me alone, so my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation." But Moses employed, implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind. And do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the heaven, and all the land that I have promised you I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Our Jewish siblings are in the middle of their high holy days. Rosh Hashanah began, uh, was on Thursday, and it concludes with Yom Kippur this coming Saturday. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. It ends the 10 days of awe, a time of repentance and reflection and setting right. My understanding is it is in some way associated with this story, or this story is associated with that time. The giving of the law to the people in word and page, though not yet in stone, and they're failing to live up to it immediately. Well, we Christians have taken the story in Genesis 3 of the first people and the fruit and the tree as our primary and foundational understanding of evil in the world, the Jewish community takes this story as foundational in we could have done better. Very important, just without the cosmic weight we keep putting on things. Now, from last week to this week, we had left the Israelites outside of Egypt, but not yet having crossed the sea. Now they have crossed the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea, and they have found themselves in the wilderness at the bottom of Mount Sinai. And what ends up happening is that Moses goes up to God and talks to God and comes back down and tells the people what they need to know and what's going to happen, and they agree. And then God, Moses and God go back up the mountain. They have some more conversations, and the people freak out, and they're like, oh, no, God seems really scary. Moses, why don't you be the person so that we don't have to deal with the scariness of this God who sends lightning and moves in fire and cloud. And they're given the Ten Commandments, written down 
on paper, papyrus, and they agree. They are given the covenant, and then Moses goes back up the mountain with God. And it seems that Moses and God spend time putting it down in stone, putting the covenant down in stone. Now, there are multiple ways to read Bible stories. And one of them is to put yourself in the characters. And what we really like to do is put ourselves in the characters of the people who did it right. Our heroes, our leaders, the kings and queens. Because we think we want to learn from the people who did it correctly, who did it well. But I don't know if that's me or that's us. Maybe you are really great at getting everything right on the first chance or never caving to the needs of the crowd or always succeeding, but but not quite me. In our story, we could align ourselves with Moses, who was able to have this intimate and deep conversation with God, who was able to communicate with God nearly face to face, who was able to craft prayer to change God's mind. Who wouldn't want that kind of ability and relationship with God? Or we could place ourselves in the story as Aaron, the high priest, the second in command to Moses, who looked at the face of millions of people who were about ready to riot. And I wonder if maybe he thought he could convince them to stop if he asked for their gold. But they would not be stopped. And maybe he thought he could just nudge them back in the right direction by saying that this is a festival to the Lord, with capital L-O-R-D, the name of God. I don't know what lessons we get from Aaron. I think he was between a rock and a hard place or a riot and his life. So maybe we should find ourselves in that massive crowd of people who had told Moses that they wanted Moses to stand to stand between them and God, to be their go-between, their tangible, tactile interaction with God. And then Moses and God went up the mountain and came down and up and down and up. And at some point, the weight of the glory of God in a cloud and thunder and lightning descended on the top of that mountain. And maybe it's been a while. And maybe it got quiet. And maybe God had to focus to do all of that writing on the stone to get it right. Maybe the thunder and lightning had grown quiet, and it had been 40 days, or a full cycle of the moon, or just a very long time, and Moses hadn't been back. And they were just sitting there, waiting, at the bottom of a mountain, knowing that this wasn't going to be their final destination, that eventually they would have to move on, and not knowing where they were going, or how they were going to get there, and who was going to lead them. They needed something tangible to hold on to, something they could see and feel and touch, something to make sense of the world around them because none of it made any sense, and that makes sense to me. Now. This is Murphy, and Murphy is an internet-famous bird. He began living at the wild, I'm sorry, the World Bird Sanctuary in Missouri when he was just a young bird. And due to some injuries, Murphy has not been able to fly. The reason people are so fascinated with Murphy was because he began nesting. And what he began nesting was a rock. Murphy had found a rock about the size of an eagle's egg and spent the next 35 days sitting on it and waiting for it to hatch. He did all the things good eagle dads do. He built a nest for it, 
He kept the rock warm. He turned the rock with his beak several times a day. And Murphy was very protective. He would squawk at other eagles as they approached and got close to him and his egg. Rock. And while this was a fun novelty story on the internet, apparently bird experts tell us that this is far more common than you think. That there are documented cases of birds sitting on pebbles, golf balls, bones, seashells, even sticks, and experts call them pseudo-eggs. They mix in harmlessly with real eggs, and other times birds will roll perfectly healthy eggs eggs out of their nest in favor for their pseudo eggs. And there are many theories as to why this might happen, but most have settled on this. Confusion. Birds have an overriding drive to nest, and so in the absence of real eggs, they choose pseudo eggs. Murphy gets a happy ending. Last year, when he nested his fur his first time at the end of the 35 years, the staff of the bird sanctuary swapped his rock out for a rescue egglet, which Murphy raised as his own, and who was able to be released. And Murphy did such a great job that he fostered another orphan egglet this summer. It's a very sweet and heartwarming story. It's a miracle facilitated by the workers at the bird sanctuary. But elsewhere in the world, untold numbers of God's creatures, without knowing, lavish their devotion on false things. Out of a misguided instinct, they waste their hours tenderly nurturing and fiercely defending these objects that they have gathered that will never love them back. And they give their lives in service to that which cannot give them life, as did the Israelites. At, in the desert at the base of the mountain, as do we. Now, most of us have been brought up to think about idols as these large, symbolic statues of other gods, like our golden calf, or some literal representation to replace one god with another. And Neil Gaiman's American Gods, the ancient gods of ancient religions, are dwelling, are dwindling. or have found a way to survive. They are embodied in our world. They take on, eventually, have a war with the new gods, the gods of today, of technology, of wood and stone and iron as technologies rise up and fall again, of Mr. World and Mr. Town. I wonder if that's what it felt like for the Israelites that the old God who had brought them out of Egypt was no longer there and there was some, they needed something new and tangible in its place. Now many people have argued over the years about what Na Neil Gaiman should have included in the book of gods, of who the modern gods are and should be, but I don't know, but I can tell you this. The first thing that I do in the morning is turn off my alarm, which happens to be on my phone. And once I'm on my phone, I scroll through and look at different things that are happening in the world. And the Bible study group gave me a lot of credit for looking at the news and caring for things that are happening. And there's a little of that, but it's mostly not. It's mostly just time wasting, usually just stuff. And I can spend an hour in bed scrolling through all kinds of things which absolutely defeats the purpose of having put on alarm in the first place. I can spend hours in front of this device offering up my time, my energy, and sometimes my money. I protect it. I purchase things to keep it safe because, and keep it from harm because I will inevitably drop it. But there are many who want their phones to look incredibly pretty and spend money to adorn it, to make it look nice and shiny. I create space for it to sit up and be helpful and useful while I work or play 
I purchase things that make it more accessible for me to have, use all of the possibilities that my phone might give me. When I don't know what to do or where I am going, I can turn to my phone and receive information and get directions. This could be a tool for our relationships or our home life or our work. But who hasn't been sitting at a dinner table You've got mail. and had some notification on your phone and grabbed it and interrupted the world that is happening right in front of you or the world that is happening somewhere else? We make idols out of things because we think they're going to be the answer. That it's going to be the solution for why we are unhappy or lonely or feel like there's no purpose. We gather up items. We collect things. We hoard money. We purchase the latest fads. We hold up beauty and fitness standards. We hold up an ideal thinking that if it can all just be perfect, everything will be okay. And it becomes an idol that we grasp onto and we hold onto because we gives, helps us make sense of this world that is often impossible to make sense of. And it all makes sense. This isn't me judging everyone. I absolutely do it too. But we don't have, we don't have a zoologist or a bird expert to come replacing the things that we have held onto, that we have grasped onto with everything we have. There is no one replacing rocks with a bird. There is no one replacing idols with life. What brings life? What brings freedom and joy? What brings purpose? What brings community? What brings all these things even when the world is confusing and unsettling and sad and lonely and hard? And then the words of God come again. I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. I am the God who sets you free. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the bread of life. I am life. I am. There is life. And there is life abundant in God, life enough to share, life enough to give us purpose and hope and direction and love, love enough to give away. So I wonder, where does your time, your energy, your resources, your money go? What are the idols in your life, the rocks that you have invested your energy into that aren't giving you life and aren't fulfilling, particularly the ones that go unnoticed. I wonder if maybe we could track it for a while, for a week. What is bringing you life? Or are they all just rocks? <laughs>